Y'all better sit down. I can assure you that the next few moments together, I did not come to play with a devil. And the level of warfare that has come against me, my marriage, my children, my family, if he wants to hit hard, I'm gonna hit back. I want you to look around real quick, look at your neighbors, look, look, just look at them. If you're able to without it being weird and creepy and awkward, Give them a smile. Give them a smile. Don't do the weird one. Don't do that. That's creepy. <laughs> How are you? It's nice to meet you. <laughs> Don't do that. That's creepy. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take about 10 seconds, and I want you to speak life to uh, the person next to you or someone near you. Everybody needs to be encouraged and I need you to take 10 seconds and you can say something as simple as God's plan for your life is about to come to pass in the next 24 hours so you should expect God to, you know, you could, I mean, <laughs> whatever you can get in 10 seconds. I want you to speak an encouraging word of life to the person next to you. But it's after I say these words, I'm going to say on your mark, get set. So, Because words are the seed to the creative power of God. I'm going to jump into that in just a second. <clears throat> so have you decided who you're going to speak life to? Look around real quick. Don't be trying to choose whoever's next to you. You're single. Like, they're married. I don't want to speak life to them. I want to speak life to the single girl in the back. No, sir. Speak life where you are, sir. God will allow you to speak life to her later, sir, after church, sir. Hi. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Are you ready? On your mark, get set. So. So, the breath that you used to speak life to someone else was breath well spent. God gave it to you, and he expects you to use it to build his kingdom. The kingdom is not buildings and facilities. The kingdom is people. And you just built the kingdom by building up your brothers and your sisters with your words. I don't know if you missed it, but we look for supernatural things. And in a very normal exchange, the supernatural just occurred. I am going to share a word that I have never preached before. And... I asked the Lord for fresh bread for this conference. Uh, I don't know how I will be viewed after this sermon, but I do not care. You know, what Pastor Benny said is, is right. We start filming for our new show on Oprah Winfrey's network in about a week. And it's unbelievable. Like, we were sitting at Oprah's house having tea. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, I'm sorry. I, I actually tinkled a little bit. So just, <laughs> you have an extra diaper. Never mind. I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. It was so funny because you would think that in a moment like that, you'd be overwhelmed and all of that. And it felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Because God will always prepare you for the place he's taking you. So what looks overwhelming to you now will feel natural when you get there. That's how you know it's super 
natural. <laughs> I'm going to try to preach. I'm trying, mama. I'm trying. <laughs> you can tell she, go to, she used to go to a Pentecostal church. Come on, preacher. You better say that. No, that's right. We are praying for the state of Florida and Georgia and South Carolina. Something unprecedented, though. They said this storm actually, once it hits the eastern seaboard, is going to come back. It could potentially gain strength and hit Florida again. That has never happened in the history of weather. Clearly, something is happening. And I believe the people of God need to be aware. And let me make this clear, just in case there's some godless person out there who thinks God sends hurricanes to punish people. God is in control of the whole thing. He did not send it. It is a part of the state of a broken planet. It is a part of what we live in. It is a result of us not taking dominion in the garden. So sickness, disease, anomalies, all of these things are a result of the fallen state of man. This is not God's punishment. I'm trying to help somebody any more than God gives cancer to us to teach us a lesson. That's, a, that's the worst theology I've ever heard. What, what parent would give their child? I'm going to give you cancer so you can learn a lesson. That's a devil. That's bad theology. And anybody who says it needs to shut up, close your Bible, and get a regular job because you don't represent the heart of a loving father. I'm tired of Anyway, let me, let me focus, because I'm about to be mad. <laughs> like, why is he so angry, Mommy? Why is the large brown man angry? Because <laughs> good preaching matters. Yeah. We got too many people who don't want to preach sound doctrine. Luke chapter 4. Reading from the New King James Version. There's a lot going on in the world right now, a whole lot. We are in the middle of a very contentious political cycle, more tension in our nation than we've had since the 1960s. There is anger, hostility, and unspoken fear all over this place. The types of weather anomalies that we're seeing, all manner of wars, all manner of uh, you know, conflict still in the Middle East, People here can't find jobs. And in the midst of that, largely, the church is silent. Strange that everybody's looking for leadership and is sitting right here in this room. Six people caught it. The rest of y'all are like, wow, well, where are they? I don't... I don't where are they? They're sitting in your chair like, no way, are they sitting? It's you. You're waiting on a supernatural somebody to show up and it's you. The enemy always goes after obvious targets. What he can't prepare for is the you. Working that job and taking care of your kids and doing the best you can for your family in locations that there are no cameras and nobody sees. You're the ones that he couldn't prepare for because God hid you while he was making you. Because God always hides his best in the worst locations. And I'm not talking geographical. I'm talking emotional, spiritual. I'm talking to people. If anybody will be honest in here, this has been not an easy year. This has not been an easy season. This is, yeah, we worshiping, but we got some scars. We, and, it, and this is the power of your worship. Can you worship with scars? Can you worship after no? Because a lot of us have had to worship after no. We praying, we're believing. God was like, no. I still love you. I bless you. You are worthy. Ooh, I'm mad at you. I'm mad at you. Ooh. 
but you are still God, and which means your no must be a yes somewhere else. And even if it's not a yes, your no is good because you are good. Is there anybody that can give God worship after no? When you have graduated to give God beyond the answer to your prayer, now you can expect a move of God in your life. We are in a different season. And it's funny, Pastor Benny, you were, you were talking about, you know, how the Lord blessed this man to got a $35 million building. Like, God, what about us? And I was looking at this building, like, this building is amazing. <laughs> I take this Cracker Jack box. <laughs> this is off the hook. It's hot, though. Um, that's why I'm standing still. I already sweating. Just, I ain't even as big as I was two weeks ago, but I'm already just already. I'm gonna just preach just like this. I'm not even gonna move. But what's funny is I believe God wants us to be this close. Because everywhere else, we're so divided. We're so separated. We're so far away. We don't even understand how to have community. We'll text people sitting right next to us. My wife will text me if I'm in the bathroom and she is seven feet away on the bed. What you doing? I'd be like, come and see. <laughs> We're in an age where you don't have to engage human beings. God says, I kind of like it this way because this is what family is. Shoulder up next to somebody, shaking hands accidentally bumping into somebody's kneecap. It's family. It's, it's not perfect. It's, it's not easy. It, it's hard to park and, and, and it's a little hot. It's uncomfortable. And that's what family is because we're not in a comfortable season. This is not peacetime in the kingdom. It's wartime. And we need as little space between us as possible because the enemy will always attack the isolated animal first. I need a seven second praise break. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Come on, bless him, bless him, bless him. It's funny because, Pastor Benny, I'm trying to figure out, we got a lot of people all over, especially in the United States, who, you know, Western Christianity is different from African Christianity because over there, all they have is Jesus. They'll stay in the rain for eight hours singing, we give you all the glory, we worship you, our Lord, you are worthy to be praised. And they walk miles to get there, glad to be there, and will stay there all night worshiping God because they don't have anything else. And then you hear the reports of miracles and blinded eyes open. Could it be that maybe we've gotten a little lazy with our fancy buildings and our carpeted seats and all of our covered parking and our velvet rope mentality and our big buildings and we think we've arrived when in fact all of that stuff could lull you to sleep and a false sense of complacency thinking that a building equals God's presence? And of course, to the untrained pastors and leaders who are looking at the, the, the Benny Perez's and Dr. Michael Maidens and all of the great other pastors around saying, I wish I could have that. And Lord, how come I don't have that? And you're too busy asking him why you don't have that and not grateful for what you do have. Because the enemy sows seeds of comparison and the enemy of the anointing is comparison. Yes. I need to have a couple thousand members, but you ain't faithful with the nine you got. 
I need thousands to change the world. Talk to me, Jesus. He had 12. One of them was a devil, and they were the foundation of what we're in right now. It ain't about numbers. It's about obedience. Obedience brings the audience. I need a six and a half second praise break. Six, five, four, three, two. We don't have time to be playing games. We've had a lot of services, a lot of church services, a lot of worship songs. Rhetorical question, don't answer. All these services, all these songs, have you changed? How come we ain't seeing Mark 16? Where are the miracles, the signs and wonders that are supposed to follow those that believe? How come we just take it as this is church as usual? I don't want that. I, I came here because I need a supernatural touch of God for me. I need God to revive and restore My engine light is on red, Pastor Benny. I'm overheating because I've given so much for so long and nobody's poured back into me. Except a couple of y'all. Pastor Benny being one of them. I know I can call him when I'm going through and he will call me and be like, the Lord put you on my heart. What's going on? You all right? That's friendship. That's brotherhood. You so into that. I know I can get a word from God if, I, if I'm lost or if I need some direction. I know Dr. Michael Maiden hears from God. I know. I heard him speak to me years ago when some of y'all didn't know who I was. He said, God's going to align you and connect you, and Tyler Perry's going to call you. And what he didn't tell me is that Oprah was going to call first, and then we're going to be on the same network as Tyler, and we're going to be in the same building as Tyler, so we'll have to bump into Tyler, which means what you spoke is going to come to pass, but we didn't know that Oprah would be the key. See, y'all, you don't know what's in this room tonight. Ooh, if you knew what was in this room and what was about to be released in the next 20 minutes, you would throw your chair to that wall and run all... A if you knew what was getting ready to be released in here. I wonder if there are 75 people that have a prophetic unction to give God praise before the word is released. told my wife, I preach all the time. Nobody asks me how I'm doing. I said, thank you. <laughs> my point was there are, some, there are some leaders. Chris Hodges is one of them. He'll, he'll, he knows. There are people that do. But because we're in a, a, a church culture that unfortunately celebrates gifts over wholeness, as long as you perform, they love you. But now pastors are falling left and right, big time. I don't have to name names. If, you, if you're a part of the body of Christ, there are pastors that are resigning from huge churches, just walking away, things happening. And all of a sudden, they're now disqualified. How are they disqualified? They were preaching to you two weeks ago till you knew what they were going through. Now they're no longer qualified. Isn't it funny that the same stuff you struggle with, we're not allowed to struggle with? But we on the front lines, you behind us, of course we gonna get hit. I'm talking to some pastors in here. I'm talking to some leaders in here. I'm talking to some volunteers in here, some associate pastors in here, some youth pastors in here. What you're going through is exactly, exactly what we're all going through, but we're afraid to tell the truth because sheep don't do well with blood. So where do shepherds go to bleed? We're not allowed to struggle. I'm telling you up here, I'm, I love God, but I needed to get here to get into a place so I could be revitalized. But the sermon's not about me. 
You in Luke 4. I was talking about the state of the churches because once the church uses your gift and you're no longer able to produce, they just throw you away. It's only the church that throws away their wounded. As if we weren't wounded when, when God found us. We like, we like our, our leaders with the plastic smile. Everything's perfect all the time. I'm never going to play that role. I'm scarred. I'm flawed. I got attitude issues. Me and my wife, we argue just like you and your spouse. We, we go through it. She get on my nerves. I want to put her in a garbage can and roll her to the curb. And she wants to do the same to me. And you get on my nerves. You get on my nerves. I love you, girl. Don't go nowhere. It's bipolar. I can't stand you. Don't go nowhere. Don't touch me. Hold me. <laughs> get out. Come back here. <laughs> stand up, boo. Let them see what I'm talking about. Stand up. That's Aventer Gray right there. What I realized, Pastor Benny, is that all of the strain and the stress and the struggle of what we do, it's coming to a head. And anything that's not like God is falling to the ground. You want to turn that on, uh, vibrate? Thanks. <laughs> Somebody's phone just going up. Hey, baby, I'm in church. I'm going to call you back. All right. <laughs> Anything not like God is being exposed. No, I'm like... <laughs> The challenge with the conference called Supernatural is you have an expectation of the supernatural. But in the mindset of supernatural, we've got to deal with what you think the supernatural is versus what the biblical definition of supernatural is. And until your mind and your expectation lines up with the biblical New Testament iteration of supernatural manifestation, you will be sadly disappointed because when we think supernatural, we think Chris Angel, we think David Copperfield, we think David Blaine, but they are not supernatural, they are illusionists, just like many people who are in the church today who are illusionists and they stand behind lights and flashing signs, but they don't have no oil, they're just a bunch of fake Oz's behind the curtain and the real wizard. God is exposing anything that's not real. Watch this. I didn't say he's exposing anything that's not perfect. Because if he's exposing that, then we all get exposed. None of us are perfect. But you can be imperfect and available. Is there anybody imperfect? and still available? Who said right here? Like, who was that? Yes, sir. Anybody else? Imperfect, but available. Struggle, but available. Don't get it right every day, but available. Still have some things God needs to work out in your character, but available. Still battling, still have challenges, but available. Every now and then you want to cuss, but I don't most of the time, but I'm available. Who am I talking to? I need to talk to some real people to set you free because that's where God can put his super on your natural. Jesus can't save Superman, but he sure can save Clark Kent. Are, are there any Clark Kents in the building? Help me, God. Take your cape off. There's only one who is super take your mask off. There's only one superhero. God's looking for some flawed vessels available with the limited resources you have and you submit those things to God so he can put his super on your natural. Because we've been having too much play play church. We're waiting on big time signs and wonders and flashing symbols and 
clouds to show up in the middle of all mystical and weird and creepy. You want to see what the supernatural looks like? Go to Luke 4, verse 16, reading from the New King James. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Some of y'all trying to escape where you're from. God's like, I'm going to keep you right there because I want to show the people who thought they knew you, they didn't have a clue what you carried. Some of y'all are like, Lord, I'm just, I'm really ready to transition. I'm just really, I'm ready. That's such a church word to say, I don't want to be here no more. Just stop giving Jesus them <laughs> church words. I just feel like transition is in my spirit. It's in my spirit. <laughs> Just say it out loud. Say it out loud. Say, stay where you're planted. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. I love that. It was customary for Jesus to be in the church, to be in fellowship. Don't be so deep that you disconnect from fellowship. We need each other. The church is needed now more than ever. Every now and then, if you need to be at online church, that's fine. But online church is, is something if you are not able to get to the building, that's a resource to use. But if you have the physical capacity to get in the presence of other believers, there is something that happens, and I encourage you to stay connected. If our Savior, who didn't need anybody, was in the synagogue, what's your excuse? And he stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all who bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, ain't this Joseph's son? What is he talking? That's, you heard that? That's Joseph's boy. That's the carpenter's son. He ain't nobody. We grew up with him. He coming here telling us he got something supernatural on him. We waiting on the Messiah to come. He over here talking about he, he's that. What, what's wrong with this? Dude? Ain't this Joseph's son? Who is this, man? What is this? The church LV? Another conference? We here again? And they missed that the supernatural had just occurred in their presence. Because they were waiting on the show. And the title of my message is The Show Is Over. The title of my message is The Show Is Over. It's time for the true church of Jesus Christ to emerge. A church that is devoid of politics and gamesmanship and one-upsmanship and competition and sectarianism and my church is better than yours and we're more anointed than yours and our worship team is cooler than yours because their genes are tinier than yours. <laughs> Because even after all that, we still ain't seen no blinded eyes open, no deaf ears open, people who came in in wheelchairs, leaving out in wheelchairs, kidneys haven't been healed, people still have arthritis, no funerals have been interrupted, but you say you represent Jesus, but the signs that should follow you aren't there, but you say you represent him. Maybe that's why people are frustrated, because they expect the word to be manifest in the presence of the church. I'm glad that we're having a supernatural conference in Vegas because nobody knows how to flash lights and woo you and trick you like Vegas. 
Many churches need to have their own version of the, of the Las Vegas Strip put out front because many places are Vegas and they don't even know it. They're, they got big lights and big buildings and all these things. But once all of the stuff is done, it's actually empty calories. Because we heard Jesus and they sang Jesus, but did we encounter Jesus? And I'm not beating up anybody. I'm not saying no names. So don't get mad at me if right now you offended because I don't even know who you are. <laughs> and if you're not offended, then praise God because I'm, I'm speaking to the spirit of the church that has caused people to doubt that God is real. But there is a remnant that God is raising up where the prophetic will be uttered and it will come to pass, where the sick will come and they will be healed, where people who are dying will recover, people who are deaf will hear, blinded eyes will be opened. This is a part of the church. We are not just here for a life class. We are here for a supernatural encounter with the power of God. It's time for heaven to invade earth. The show is over. Somebody say the show is over. over. See, the idea of the show for the religious, you can understand it because in the very beginning, it was a supernatural convergence of, of events that allowed God, that caused God to speak. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, 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 and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. So water was already there. He was hovering over it, but water doesn't just float. It had to be under something. There was a foundation. But there was, there was darkness. It was without form. It was formless and void. It was empty. That sounds like chaos. So at the convergence of chaos and darkness is creation. And what you didn't know is the areas of your life that are chaotic and the places in your life that you can't get revelation and the things that aren't quite clear yet. God has allowed those things for those moments because he's about to speak light into that place. He's he had to let it become chaotic so he could create in the midst of it. Some of y'all should shout right there because you want it, you're waiting for God to do something once your life is in order. But God actually waits for disorder because that's the sign that he can begin to create. He's looking for someone honest enough to say, I have, I, my life is a mess. It is without form and it is void. He says, now that is a, that's, that's somebody I can see. Let there be light. And when he gives light, watch what he does. He didn't say, let there be order. He said, let there be light, which means before I deal with the chaos, let me put some light on it. Then I'm going to start to form in the midst of it, create around it, and speak to it. Wow. You want God to get rid of it. He's not getting rid of it. He's about to build around it. Why? Because at the end of it, you'll have dominion over it. When God got finished creating, we got dominion. Woo! I don't want to get too deep into that because that's not actually all the way in my notes. And I already only got 15 minutes because we was worshiping. Y'all took my time up worshiping, singing and stuff. <laughs> you know that clock don't mean nothing to me. We're going to be here till about. I don't even know why the clock is on. Just turn it off. It all began in 1973. I'm going to be here as long as I want. After what the devil put me through. I'm going to preach till somebody get free in here. I'm going to preach till somebody gets breakthrough in here. I'm not leaving until I know that God has shown up. I'm tired of putting a time limit on God. That's right. Turn that clock off. You heard what the man of God said, girl. Thank you. There it is. Now I feel better. Now I feel like preaching because I ain't under the clock. Ah, we 
interrupt this regularly scheduled service. Holy Ghost, come on in the room. There was water, there was chaos, the earth was without form and void. There was some natural things there, and then God put his super on top of the natural. His spirit was hovering over the water. The super was on top of the natural. So the first key to a supernatural move of God is the acceptance of the natural, and then the declaration, there is more. Say it out loud, there is more. You don't see it yet because you're here, you drove up here, you got on your premium jeans and your nice shirt. But God's about to bring this sentence to life. There is more. To who you are, to what you're manifesting, to the way you're living, there is more. You know it when you go home, you can almost feel it like something's about to break in your favor. That's the whisper of the Holy Ghost saying, there is more. Some of you, the enemy wants you to believe that where you are in your life is the plateau of your life. It is a lie. It's actually the foundational place because there is more. But God needs you to get in your spirit. There is more so that you can have an expectation so that when more arrives, you won't talk yourself out of more. There's some single people in here and you're like, God, how long I'm going to be single and so many people that try to talk to me. Yeah, but he got like three teeth, girl. That's not more. That's less. <laughs> Somebody say there is more. More teeth. <laughs> Your life is about to look like what God has said. I don't want my life to look like what I want. I want my life to look like what he said. Because all the days were written for me when as yet there were none of them. This is what David said. The writer said, "You these days are written, so I want my life to look like what he said. What has been written, I want to walk that out. I don't want to rewrite the book and live in less than. I want the more. How do we get there, Henry? Well, we got to let go of the thing we're holding on to. And a lot of us have been caught up in the show. took my wife to a concert recently and it was at a stadium. It was 80,000 people in there and it was just crazy. It was like all of these folk. But then at the end, the person on stage said, thank you, good night. He turned the lights off. But for an hour and a half or two hours, it was just unbelievable. All of these moving parts and dancing and costume changes and all of this stuff. And then just like that, it was over. And you got to go back to your real life. And what's happened is that church has become the thing people go to. But you don't know what to do when the show is over. And so you didn't even know why you were frustrated because the, the book of Acts, the church of Acts was not a show. It was the community of believers who lived together and had all things common, distributing to each one as they had need. Which means if the church was really the church, we wouldn't need as many social service programs. We wouldn't be worrying about social security as much because the church would be taking care of the elderly and the church would be taking care of its orphans and its widows and the veterans who served our nation and put their lives on the line. If the church did what it was supposed to do, we would be protecting the lives of those who couldn't fight for themselves and we'd be celebrating police officers and we'd be looking for those who were hurt and underprivileged and feel disenfranchised as well. We wouldn't be judging people, we'd be loving people and the church wouldn't look like just me, the church would look like the kingdom and so black and white and Mexican and Puerto Rican and Colombian, oh my goodness, this place looks Looks like the church. I need a 20 second praise break in here. 
19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Somebody bless him. If you know that you are a part of a church that is bigger than culture, bigger than color, bigger than money, bigger than your past, bigger than your failure, bigger than your pain, bigger than your language, if you know that you are a part of a living, moving, functioning body of Christ, then give that Jesus a great praise. This is what he died for. Not an hour and a half on a Sunday morning for you to go back to your regularly scheduled life. Your life is supposed to be a supernatural move of God. The show is over. Jesus comes on the scene. The Jews are looking for Mashiach, waiting for the Messiah to overthrow the Roman rule of government so they can finally have political power. And Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. I'm not here to run for office. I'm already on the throne. But I can understand because religion will have you thinking about the show. Because in the Old Testament, the father was showing off. He was a pillar of cloud by, by day. He was fire by night, sending frogs and locusts and plagues and lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Killing the firstborn, you did not mess with him. Talk to the Assyrians. One angel killed a hundred plus thousand in one night. God is a bad, bad God. He, you don't play with him. He is not to be toyed with. He was doing supernatural stuff to establish his people. And then he said, listen, I need y'all to understand me. And the first way I want you to understand me is through the law. So he had Moses come up to the mountain and he gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And then Moses came down the mountain and saw the people down there backing it up and dabbing and setting it off with the golden calf because religion... makes you think that the external stuff, the pillar, the fire, the cloud, when that stuff's not happening, God must not be there. That's why people get weary with church because they think church is always about the next big cataclysmic experience and we're waiting for the explosion and the... <laughs> That's why he had to talk to the prophet when Elijah ran to the mountain was a big earthquake first, then it was some fire. God gave him the show, but God didn't show up till the show was over. He came in a still small voice. He said, hey, that's when he put his cloak over his head. He said, I'm in the presence of God. I thought he was going to come in the form of a show, but the show is over. Some of y'all are waiting for tickles and emotions and tingly things, but the show is over. It's called discipline. Yeah. Yeah. You want to see God? Covenant to spend time with him every day before you go to work. Oh, you won't get a lot of applause on that because we're still a part of the show. And God says, I'm not a puppet to show up and manifest. Ooh, I am the Lord. You want to get to know me? Spend time with me. Have conversation with me. Read my word. Talk to me. I'll talk to you. It's a conversation. It's not a monologue. It is a dialogue. Will anybody praise God for that? I feel the presence of God in here. Something just shifted in the atmosphere. I sense it in my spirit. I sense something just came off. There was a layer of something. I feel like God is pulling the curtain back. Because see, in the show, they pull the curtains forward because they don't want you to see that it was all just an illusion. But here, when the show is over, he pulls the curtain back to show you all that stuff was never him. Yeah. And so the Old Testament was all of these things. And they were waiting. Deuteronomy 18, even Moses said, there's a prophet rising from among us, from your people, and him you shall hear. It was a, a, just a declaration that the Messiah was coming. And Melchizedek was another whisper that the Messiah was coming. 
Jacob wrestled with a pre-incarnate Jesus, a declaration that the Messiah was coming. The prophets talked about him. Isaiah talked about him. The Messiah is coming. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace, everlasting father coming soon. And everybody thinks coming soon. And it's always about the show. And then there was 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. And then in Luke chapter two, after all of this build up for thousands of years and all of these things and canonical scripture being written over 40 different writers, 1500 years of history and God's big coup de grace, the final act, the thing that we've all been waiting for after fire and pillar and laws and mountains and creation and all of a sudden everything converged in the form of wah, wah, a baby in a manger from a pregnant unwed teenage mother betrothed to a man who was a part of a lineage that had fallen on hard times. Wait, (laughs) but you're God. You can do anything. You could have come down and spelled his name in the rocks and put it in the air, turned it into a cloud formation, and the whole world would have had to see. But then it's not called faith. All of this stuff you did and your big manifestation of your master plan to save the world and redeem your people (laughs) was a baby. What a strange way to save the world. I knew I wouldn't get a lot of applause there because... We're expecting for God to do something explosive like fireworks and he'll send a baby in a manger. And you're waiting for God to show up over there. He's in the barn. You're waiting on favor from a CEO. But the Lord said, if you were nice to the valet... You're trying to get favor and kiss butt to get ahead when the greatness is in serving those who don't have anything to give you. I can't wait. When I get money, I'm going to write checks and I'm going to announce it to the church. Oh, that's where Jesus went to the show one time. The Bible says he went to the church and watched the people give offering. That's uncomfortable. Just Jesus down there. What you getting? Look at All the rich people was giving out. Hello, I'm here. <laughs> then one woman. Wasn't she a widow? Yeah, no husband. Middle Eastern Jewish culture. That means you don't have any covering, no money. Nothing. She had, what, two mites? How much is that worth in today's money? Like a penny? Maybe less than a penny? Half a penny. She had half a penny but had enough faith and and a lack of pride. You got to have a lack of pride to put on your envelope half a penny. Some of y'all, when you didn't have money, you just put it in the basket. When you had money, you put it on the envelope because you felt better about your gift. But your breakthrough was writing on the envelope when you had 50 cents. Because that was the end of your pride. She went up and Jesus said, stop, look, her. She gave more than everybody else. He showed them the supernatural. And they missed it. And what he said with her, see that, now that, that's how you know the show is over. When you can give that and still trust Abba to provide. See, the show is over now where we're playing these church games, but God doesn't show up like we want. The show is the religious expression without the manifestation of his power. For those who are trying to figure out where you're going with this idea of the show being over. 
Because I want you to stop looking for something supernatural when you are the supernatural thing. The fact that you're still alive is a supernatural touch of God. Am I talking to any former anythings in here? 17 of y'all. So none of y'all ever been through nothing. You, you never had unprotected sex that should have gave you HIV, but God in his love kept you. You don't want people to know that you used to struggle, that you used to lust, that you used to sin, that you had addiction, that you used to lie, that you slept with somebody who wasn't your wife or your husband. You don't want anybody to know that stuff, but then you want to come in here and act like you have it all together, but your life is a supernatural testimony to the goodness of God and the grace of God and the favor of God. God. And if it wasn't for God, not only would you not be here, you shouldn't be here. And if you really want to see the supernatural, stop looking around and look in the mirror. Somebody give God a supernatural praise. The thing is, Pastor Benny, and I'm, I'm, I'm rounding third and heading for home. I'm almost done. In John chapter 6, uh, verse 30, the people were like, show us a sign. We may believe. They're always looking for a sign. What did Jesus say? He said, it's a wicked and adulterous generation. Isn't that? Ooh, that's a lot. It's one thing to be wicked, but adulterous too. Wait, I didn't say let's go to the club. I just asked you to prove it. <laughs> See, the thing about adultery is not just the sex. The sexual aspect is not just the only component to adultery. The key to adultery is that you left the thing he gave you looking for the next thing. He said, y'all want a sign so y'all could leave and go to the next thing. Then somebody else comes along and does something else, you'll go to the next thing. And that's the problem with religion. We got too many churches open for the show trying to woo people with itching ears who don't want to stay in their place. They don't want to stay rooted. They're just looking for the next thing. I'm trying to help. There's a couple young people over there that got it. I need one section to get this thing because once, I don't know where it's coming from, but the worship from that thing is going to flood this place and we're finally going to have the breakthrough that we're supposed to have in the next couple minutes. Stop looking for the next thing when you already have the best thing. I said stop looking for the next thing when you already have the best thing. Too many people, too many people want to date the church. They want to date Jesus until Jesus get on, they, get on their nerves with stuff like standards <laughs> and expectation and an expectation of growth and maturity. Then you want to leave him for something else that's a little watered down. More watered down gives you more leeway to sin. I want to go to a church where well, they'll just allow me to be me. You can be you anywhere. Jesus loves everybody as they are. But as you grow in him, what you were is not what you will become. Stop looking for a place that will validate your brokenness. Stay planted and let the Lord change your character. The show is over. The days of contemporary play church are over. And God is sitting down people that are playing church. And people who won't just preach this gospel. No more watered down preaching preachers. If you're watching and you're a preacher, preach the word. Preach Christ and him crucified. The only way to the father. Unrepentant sin and rejection of the son will get you sent to hell. That's the word. That's what we preach. I didn't write it, but I believe it. If you're going to preach it, then preach it. Don't change it to please people.
people scared to preach the word, they won't give, then so what? I'd rather be pleasing to God than pleasing to man. Fear of man is a snare. The Bible is still right. Jesus is still holy. God is still on the throne. Jesus is coming back. We got to repent from our sins, turn from our wicked ways. Holiness is still right. The Holy Ghost is in this place, and you need the Holy Ghost to live a holy life. Somebody say the show is over. People always rushing to get into the building waiting for the next big thing so they can feel something and go home and not change. You've been to every conference there is and you still don't speak to people on the other side of the church. You've been in the supernatural presence of God and still got the same addictions 30 years later and God hasn't said nothing about that. Maybe you've been in the show because the last time I checked, when you encounter Jesus, everything changes. Your character changes. Your appetite changes. Your mindset changes. Your perspective changes. Your conversation changes. When you get out of the show and get into his presence, you grow. When you leave the show, that's when you grow. The show is over. All of these smoking mirrors and flashing lights, and none of it changes you. And we're waiting on the supernatural. Rise. You're about to float into the third heaven. Jesus is the supernatural manifestation of the Father. He is the Word made flesh. There was nobody more supernatural than Jesus. We didn't even know who he was till he was 30 years old. Some of y'all are like, when is it my turn? I'm anointed. Well, you can be anointed and not announced. <laughs> Jesus wasn't announced till he was 30. He was, he was the son of God when he was 12, when he was 22. But he wasn't announced till he was 30 because it wasn't time for him to be announced. But he was faithful in his process in preparation because he understood that once... Once my father releases me, I'm going to be a problem for the kingdom of darkness. I'm not here to extend religion. I'm here to usher in relationship. Religion is a show. The show is over. I'm in the building. The word has been made flesh and dwelt among us. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Close the book. Sat down. Boom. And the church was born in that moment. They didn't even know they were the witness to the new birth. They were too busy trying to delegitimize him because of who they thought he was because of where he came from. The reason why people in your family don't understand you is because they saw you grow up. They knew you when and they just can't wrap their minds that who they saw then is something different now with more power now than you ever had. But here's the thing, you had it then, it just hadn't manifested, so now they don't know how to take you. Oh, you think you better than somebody. Oh, oh, you anointed? Yes, but I didn't anoint myself. I was just faithful, and I cried, and I prayed, and I believed, and I fought for it, and I don't, I didn't make me, I didn't call me, but he did it, and he did it because he wanted to show somebody that you don't have to come from the best. You don't have to have all the degrees but he will use you if you're available. The show is over. Your family thinks you're crazy. They always have. Let them. Stop trying to explain to people what you can't see with the natural eye. Ain't that Joseph's son? 
That's the carpenter's boy. No, that's the son of God. No, it's not. I watched him grow up. If he's so anointed and he's this, how come he didn't show it when we were growing up? Because it wasn't time. I'm about to say two words. And if I say it, I don't know who this is for, but if you catch it, you're probably going to shout. I'm just saying. So just, it's time. (laughs) For who you are, for what you carry, for the thing he said, it's time. No more delay. No more denial. No more process. It's time. This is the moment where chaos and darkness give way to creation. It's time. The things that made no sense will be given clarity in this moment. It's time. The resources that had been held hostage have to come forth now. It's time. The relationships that were tenuous will now produce fruit. It's time. Businessmen and women, people of great means will come and bring resource so that the kingdom agenda in you will be established. It's time. And it ain't just about buildings and houses and land. God was bringing that anyway, but before the end of the year, you will have sevenfold manifestation of the word that he's spoken. And that word seven means completion. I believe for many here, there will be a complete manifestation of what he has declared. While you're worshiping, and I never do this, somebody needs to sow into the, this atmosphere. It ain't to me, it's to the church. If God is telling you, write it, do it, get it, get it, bring it to the altar right now, but keep worshiping. If I'm not talking to you, but if you know there is manifestation happening. I never raise offering. I don't like offering because people manipulate people thinking you're going to get a blessing. You're still going to get a blessing whether you give an offering or not. But I'm only talking to people that felt that in that moment. Give in this atmosphere. Now let's go back to worship. Don't listen and try to, nobody's manipulating anybody. By the way, I've already written four checks and sewn them tonight. So I'm not just talking it, I'm speaking it. Why, why to get quiet? You know why? Because people, because when you've been in the show, anytime somebody says money, you're reminded of the show because you gave, but nothing changed. That's how you know it was the show. Ooh, help me, Holy Ghost. If I'm speaking the word of God, does this word agree with anybody's spirit? Don't stop worshiping. I didn't tell you to stop worshiping. I just said if the Lord is speaking to you as a leader, then so. If not, keep praising. Because the show is over. I said the show is over. This is between you and God. The show is over. Write the book. Write the script. Your life is a movie. God is going to make your name known. Don't give up. He saved you. He redeemed you. He's got a plan for you. That seed just unlocked an entire level of blessing and opportunity. Sister, God loves you. And other women are going to be healed because of who you are. The show is over. I said the show is over. Henry, you've been wanting more and more is here. More revelation, more anointing. Boy, you got a word in you. You've been faithful. You serve God. You serve the vision. You love your wife. You love your sons. It's your time. It's your moment. I want you to grab this in your spirit that what looks like being circling around the mountain and God when and God how and God why, all of that's about to shift. And I believe there's oil under your feet. And God's about to bring unprecedented financial windfall to you and your house. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I hear an inheritance is coming. An inheritance is coming. An inheritance is coming. I feel the Holy Ghost in here. The show is over. An inheritance is coming. For those like me who were hidden, nobody knew me. I went to a church in my hometown. They wouldn't even let me sing in the choir. They didn't let me sing in the choir. I came out of a Baptist church. I said, I've been licensed to preach. He was like, good. 
Sit down. Which is fine. Because that's exactly what God will do. He will sit you down around the people that should see you so that when he raises you up, they can't get credit. Some of y'all been waiting for men and women to validate you. They can't because God won't let them because he made you and he made you for himself, not for the show. The show is the machine that'll use you for your gift but doesn't care about your character. The show is over. It's funny. My wife always tells me to charge my iPad. I didn't charge it. It's almost about to die, which means the, the sermon is over. <laughs> which is fine, because I was done anyway, iPad. You don't tell me. People always rushing to get inside the building so they can experience something. Thinking that if they just focus on the, the platform alone, they will somehow get closer to Jesus. But Jesus said, I'm the door of the sheep. You want to see Jesus, you run into the altar, but he was the usher. You so busy devaluing the people in the parking lot and at the door that you missed your supernatural moment when you devalued who they were looking for platforms and people and things to please your flesh. The show is over. When you leave the show, you have value for every person. When you leave the show, everybody matters. Oh, somebody should have said amen on that. When you leave the show, you fight for those who can't fight for themselves. When you leave the show, even if they come in broken, lost, if they come in in a different package than what you expect. Maybe they don't have church clothes. Maybe they don't look like you think a church person should look. What is a church person supposed to look like? That's the show talking. Come on, sweet girl. Come on, baby. The show is over. And it's time for those who God is raising up like this young man right here. Tell me your name. Where are you from? Houston, Texas. You from Houston, JR? That's down there with me. What do you do? Are you a pastor? What do you do? Live stream leadership. Father, I pray right now for JR. That as soon as he came up here, I saw your hand on him. And I pray that the mantle of leadership that you put on this young man will begin to produce supernatural fruit. That you will give him wisdom in the word that is beyond his years. That men will not get credit. That people will say he got that from God. Let him stay faithful and humble. Let him remember this moment that you did it, not him. And that he didn't earn it. It was conferred upon him. I bless you for his life. Houston will never be the same in Jesus' name. The show is over. But Jesus is here. Jesus said today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then he sat down. He announced the arrival of the after party. Because after the show, it's the after party. The party is a gathering of like-minded believers in celebration. In one common goal, one common cause. We are the church. Our one commonality is that the same blood that saved you saved me. We don't look alike. We don't all see the same way. We didn't come from the same place. We don't all have the same resources. We don't all have the same political ideology. It doesn't matter because the same Jesus that saved you saved me. There's not a black Jesus. There's not a Mexican Jesus or a white Jesus. There's not a rich Jesus or a poor Jesus. There is one Jesus and he is our Jesus and he unifies us. The show is over, but Jesus is on the throne. So there's no show, but there is one star. His his name is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And if you believe that the show is over and you're glad that religion no longer rules the day, but relationship has come, then you need to give Jesus a great praise because the show is over.